Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you here in Brussels in the European Parliament and uh, we are together to talk about hunting, about uh, what is happen if we stop with hunting. But first of all, I would like to introduce uh, myself. I'm Karl-Heinz Florenz, I'm a member of this parliament. I would like to introduce Ali Kakai. He is the ambassador of CIC in Africa. I would like uh, Wilfried Papst, he's the vice chairman of the Nature Reserves in Zimbabwe. And uh, I would like to uh, welcome and introduce Terry de la Sky, he is the secretary general of the European landowner organization, a very powerful organization in Europe. Um, Mr. de la Sky, or Terry, what do you believe if uh, some idea comes up? Uh, maybe in this parliament or maybe in the member states to uh, stop hunting in Europe? Well, it's quite uh, an interesting question because, uh, first of all, there has been an attempt in the parliament to uh, vote a resolution in favor of uh, banning trophy hunting. And we as Europeans have faced that and feel it uh, could be disastrous. Let's have a look to the situation in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we are, they have almost prohibit hunting. They make it very difficult. As a consequence, well, um, they prohibit, of course, um, control of predation. Birds nesting on the ground disappear and they had to reopen after 10, uh, 10 years uh, shooting the fox or controlling the foxes as a predator. Not a good news because they lost a lot of uh, uh, species which are endangered. So it's really bad and it is not coherent in terms of solidarity in the European Union. If you look in addition to this, what they have done uh, by prohibiting shooting on uh, big game, <coughs> uh, they uh, just make sure that uh, there was an explosion of population. But the wild wars, the explosion of population led to an explosion of incident in the traffic. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's directly related. And uh, let's take into consideration the deer management. Well, they, they are very hunty. Uh, they are very strong opponents and very hunty uh, hunting organization. And they were trying to show in a polder in an area that hunting is not needed. And so they have protected. And at certain time, there was, of course, an overpopulation. And the bad luck for them, there was a train, there were high roads in between. And people were starting to question why so many animals were starving. At the end, there were thousands of animals starving of disease, of hungry, and finally, they uh, ordered to kill 4,000 animals. Well, it's nonsense if you have to pay administration uh, to kill animals. Where are we? When hunters are ready to do it for free and to manage sustainability and environment. I think it's a disaster, and therefore we are afraid of this uh, non well forked proposal here in Parliament. They should have a look at the situation where it's going wrong. Yeah, thank you for this clear statement, Winfried Papst. Um, you have a lot of experience in Zimbabwe. Could you imagine that uh, Europe starts with banning hunting? I can imagine it. Um, I can tell you what is going to happen. It's going to be totally disastrous. Apart from anything, let's start with the, the fact that Zimbabwe, Southern Africa, which I know at large, has a very excellent, um, uh, tremendously positive um, experience in conservation. And it embraces very much uh, sustainable hunting. Why? Sustainable hunting provides a major part of the funding that is required for sustainable uh, utilization of game for the creation of conservancies, nature parks and all the rest of it. Uh, please understand that generally the business, if you so want to call it, and it's not really a business, if you're not a philanthropic investor and you have your heart in it, you shouldn't be in it because you're not going to make money on it. So if you have a break-even situation and you take out of that Whatever portion of income comes from sustainable hunting, you will have a loss-making entity. How long is that going to last? Now, in the general context of Southern Africa, we have approximately between Namibia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, we have about 55 million hectares under private wildlife use. All 
dependent on the income from sustainable hunting to a larger or a lesser degree. Even the lesser, if I break even and I lose 20% of my income, I now lose 20% of my money. As a businessman, who's going to fund that? It's not going to be possible. If we kill hunting, if you will, ban hunting, if you will, uh, we will lose 55 million hectares of sustainable wildlife in those three countries. That's the size of Germany and Great Britain together. We will use millions and millions, and my guess is approximately 35 million animals in those areas. We lose hundreds of thousands of jobs, and if you do understand that every family statistically is about 10 people, you will have millions of local people in Africa destitute. And then I ask yourself, isn't this a neo-colonialism approach? approach. We in Europe are dictating how Africa runs their very successful conservation. And that is ludicrous from my point of view. Uh, that's true, but uh, Europe is trying to have a more and more ban of uh, shooting some different animals. For example, in my constituency, it is not allowed to shoot uh, cats who are formal private. They are, after three months, they are was half a year, they are wild and they are no longer allowed to shut. Now the local authority has to catch the cats. Yeah. But unfortunately they are not able to catch them because it's not uh, allowed to shoot. So uh, the government should uh, in here own lake. But how is it in Africa? Mr. Kaka, you have a lot of experience. And uh, is it possible that if there comes a ban for hunting, it, if it comes, it comes anyway, not doing night, but by step by step. Is it um, increasing uh, a situation for poaching? Well, first of all, um, I think we should be very careful in the decisions that are made away from Africa, yeah. about Africa. Because there has to be a sincere consultation process, you must find out what your neighbor thinks about what you want to do uh, about his property. You simply cannot make decisions that will have major impact about a nation or a continent without sincerely consulting and listening. Now, about hunting itself, I think we should separate the emotions from facts. Here's a fact. I don't know about emotions. Here's a fact. Africa will have a population increase, no doubt. The population will double and triple in the next decade or so. People will need land. And they will take land unless there is some way for us to show that there is an incentive for wildlife to be on that land. This is a fact. This is not emotion. This is not uh, a hypothetical. It's a fact. Even now, wildlife is losing land. Why? Because the land that people are taking over, they see more out of it coming rather than from wildlife. So wildlife must be looked after in those countries. Wildlife must show that it has a value. These are facts that people must learn to listen and to read. Secondly, and this is a very important thing that, that we must understand, wildlife has to be managed. Unless, of course, either the European Union or somebody, UN or somebody says we are going to control people's population, human population through forced uh, methods contraceptive, forced and so on, and maybe they've tried before. It's never going to happen. It's wildlife that will have to be managed. How do we manage wildlife without having to take some of those population out? Selected species, selected individuals among the species. This is all about wildlife management. Now, hunting is by far the most economic and the most science-based way. Even now, for example, my country, Kenya. Kenya shoots animals mm. on a daily basis. 
It's not hunting, but the Kenya Wildlife Service consistently kills animals. It's not that there are no animals being killed, and I'm not even mentioning illegal poaching and that sort of thing. Actually, Kenya Wildlife Service kills a lot of animals. <clears throat> How does that benefit? How does that show a, a value to communities? So I think it's very dangerous to go down this road without looking at the facts consulting properly and please for god's sake remove the emotion out of it you don't have to like hunting Agreed. right but yeah. don't ban it because you don't like it mm. even people in africa not everybody says hunting you know we should we should kill animals but hunting itself is being looked at from the economic standpoint and how can it help manage populations in in a conservation area yeah, thank you. When I listen to all of you, it sounds quite logical that uh, to ban hunting creates much more problems uh, than we have before. Uh, what can all or your organization doing that uh, we have more uh, influence on the decision makers, for example, in this house? And I personally, as a long-standing member of parliament, uh, recommend my colleagues strongly to find a solution for the euro, for foreign affairs policy, mm -hmm. for refugees. And then we have so many to do that we have to work on our own place and we don't into and in, in your country. But do you want to uh, try to answer on my question? What can we do to have more influence from the hunter's interest into this house or maybe into the commission? It's very basic. We need to bring the facts that we have our ecological, our conservation successes, we need to bring them to the people. Whenever yeah. I'm in a talk show, whenever I'm in an interview, whenever I talk to non-hunters, when I put out the facts, invariably I get this thing, oh, I didn't know. Mm. Excuse me, you propagate not to hunt. You haven't investigated the damage that does mm. because this income now causes downstream damage beyond anything. You need to be educated. That's my job. That is our job. We need to do more of it. Uh, if I may, uh, we, we have to, to spread the idea, not only on sustainable hunting, but let's go a step further. The reason why we are developing, and you know about uh, the uh, wildlife uh, estate label, just to make sure that we can communicate something current to the general public and the decision maker. These are rules you implement but you, most of the hunters and all, most of the land managers do so. It's exactly what you described. But it has to be communicated and we have to assure not only the decision maker, but the population that it is going well and that it is implemented. And if I may pick uh, one of your comments, very interesting, you say, well, we, we collect the male, we protect the female, but we have to add that we collect the male after, at the moment, they are declining. Just at the moment, they have done the job of reproduction. Mm -hmm. We are not collecting male at the time they yeah. are needed for the genetics no, of, uh, of the species. And people also have to understand that because there are some confusion. There's an idea, oh, people collect the males when they are magnificent. No, no. What Willie does, and what most of them do, is make sure that they are collected when they are declining and we have stronger animals in terms of genetic coming in. Absolutely. It sounds logical, but how, why we have so less success in this field? Is it unfriendly if I say we have to work on ourselves and our communication system? Oh, no doubt, that's no exactly doubt. what no, no doubt. doubt. Yeah. The, the, Give the, us some the, advice, yeah. please. Well, the sustain... Uh, uh, yeah. I'm German. So I am associated with some of the German hunting associations and I keep on saying to our own, we're sticking our heads in the sand. Why am I living in Cape Town, the only person who stands up and discusses the issue of Cecil the Lion on German television? Nobody in Germany does that. Me, I have to do this out of... We need to be coming out with our story. I am a conservationist. I'm also a big game hunter, but I'm a conservationist. And the story of my 60,000 hectares that I created from nothing, from a cattle farm to the most pristine wildlife area that we have, produces too many, too many animals right now, but is a huge success. Why would I not be proud to go out there and tell them how was it created? Yes, some of my capital 
but then largely because of the income from sustainable hunting, less than 1% of our species, excess species, no species that are endangered in our area. Uh, and, and that makes eminent sense. So if we don't bring that out, and that's now my mission, to bring it out and tell people, I go into talk shows and do it. And I must admit, I confront people who are against hunting. And they say to me, I would never pull the trigger. I said, fine, most of my family doesn't. But Mr. Pabst, I understand the concept of it all. Let me pick up one other thing that Ali said over there. Why do we impose ourselves onto the lifestyle of Africans? What would we do if Africa would tell us how to lead our lives? The sustainable oh, scenario, in hunting scenario, conservation scenario in Africa really, really works. And we will pull the plug on it in its entirety if we stop sustainable hunting. Let's use an example, just picking up on that. Africa has been battling against subsidies for how long? But it's something that you feel it's right for you. If you want to do it, so do it. And you have been doing it. The same thing, here's Africa saying, we allow hunting because we understand it. We know it's beneficial to us. Let us do it, please. Now, there's one more point I wanted to make. Yes, let's agree hunting is not the problem. So don't bash hunting. If the problem is that some countries, not all, some countries are not managing their wildlife properly or their hunting properly, so let's deal with that issue. Which country is it that needs help in making sure that their governance of hunting, the management of wildlife is not good enough and get that up to a certain level, put in policies, put in principles, put in whatever is necessary to make sure it's done properly. There's corruption. Let's deal with that. Which is the country that has the problem and focus on that? Don't throw a blanket over something that is very good in some countries, working very well, benefiting the country and that individual who is suffering every day from wildlife to get something out of it. So let's yeah. be scientific, let's be factual before doing something. That is my point. Yeah, I think we have more or less the same, uh, uh, not such strong, but the same in agriculture. 80% um, of the population knows what 2% of the farmers has yeah. to do. I'm a politician and uh, I'm interested finally after a debate on solution and one recommendation. Is it wrong if I say that the European politician, even maybe the Commission, has an awareness problem? I, I, Absolutely. I think so. Look, uh, some of the Commission we've met, like today, do not have an awareness problem. They fully understand and they support. United Nations, FAO, CITES, all of these organizations support what we're doing. But why we have in Europe such a bad reputation under the farmer? You are the president of uh, the land organization and you have a lot of contact with the people. In, what can I, we do? I think uh, first is exactly what you describe about agriculture. Everybody has a mean about agriculture and knows better how we have to, to crop uh, the land. And it's exactly the same story about hunting, yet if not even worse. The question is that we are in many countries more and more disconnected. Our population is disconnected from the countryside. We are going into 2050, I guess, to have about 80% of the population living in cities. And those people don't know about countryside, about hunting and all of the countryside activities. And there we have to communicate and try to help people to understand because the problem is that some people are making money on uh, the anti-communication and while well, they, they are in business it there is a green business explaining what's going wrong and we have to be extremely careful with that and we have to make our work of education I want to go back to your question about awareness if you don't yeah. mind um, you know politicians where I come from are looked at as leaders. That's why we elect them. Now, I won't go into other reasons and so on, but we call them leaders. As leaders, I think they have an obligation to make sure that they make educated guests. 
educated um, decisions. The point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, before they rush into making decisions, they should educate themselves about that issue, not allow a particular set of group or people from one side come to you and pump you with all this falsified information, not fact-based information, not science-based information, but emotional. Show you pictures of dead animals. I mean, you can do that in a slaughterhouse even for cattle yeah. or a chicken slaughterhouse. You can show the same pictures, but they don't. <clears throat> they show about this fellow who has shot uh, a particular animal and make a huge emotional thing out of it. Now, as leader, you should, you should say, okay, I've looked at these pictures. Now, let me examine this in more detail. That is what I would expect the leader to do. We say, where was this done in Africa? Which country in Africa? Let me get somebody from there to give me an opinion. Somebody who knows the situation exactly to right. give me an opinion. Yes. And then you make a decision. I may be wrong, sir, but I am sure 90% of the people in the European Parliament who are supporting this do not have or have not taken the time to consult the Africans. This is something that must be done. But if I may pick this example, we have a very good, a concrete example in the Netherlands. You know that they, they don't like hunting, so they ban hunting the geese. What happens? Explosion of the geese population. Yeah. So the next step, farmers were facing a lot of damage and conservationists were facing a lot of damage because they were destroying the biodiversity, they were trying, they were paid in order to, to, to promote it. And the solution they found was to use gas to kill the geese. And nobody reacts. And this is a real moral, this is an ethical problem. Uh, I live uh, immediately on the Dutch border and uh, when they stopped uh, hunting goose, uh, millions of goose come uh, on yeah, my field yeah, yeah. and uh, we are able to shoot geese uh, between Friday and Saturday afternoon so yeah. we have no uh, really chance to hunt them and, 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 and it is not uh, uh, our biggest job to do the job from the Netherlands. But uh, you are right. We must be careful especially at this time when there's all sorts of talk about loss and decline of species like elephants and lions and so on. Why is it happening? Differentiate between illegal and legal. There's a deliberate effort of mixing the two. And for people who <coughs> aren't really educated about the issues, <coughs> it's easy to be confused. Yes, we have lost elephants very badly. Yes, we have lost lions also. Yes, we have lost rhinos very badly, etc. But let's examine the reason why. It's from illegal poaching. Let's not call it hunting, it's poaching. And that has increased because of the trade issue. It's got nothing to do with legal hunting. Absolutely. So let's not say, oh, Africa is losing all these animals, it's because of hunting. No, it's not. And people should examine these questions more carefully. This is the emotional thing that's going around. Africa is losing all its wildlife. Yes, we've lost a lot, but why? <clears throat> and it's because of the illegal part. And let's focus our attention on that. Not ban hunting and blame the loss on hunting. Thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you.